Father, we thank you for this time together. Father, we thank you for just painting a beautiful picture here today with the service, Father, that everything is just lining right up with your word, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion towards your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, there's one word that God gave me for today, for this teaching. Now, originally I had something totally different, but he changed it last week. And that one word is engage. And whenever Rick can put that up there, it's time to engage. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, that's fine. That's perfect. It's, hey, I'm feeling kind of tall today. It's time to engage. A lot of times we think of being engaged, like Kevin and Leah are engaged. Yay! That clap can keep going because I'm telling you what, we're excited about that. <laughs> Could, couldn't ask for a better couple, I'll tell you what, I'm real excited about that. It's time to engage. We're going to look at the next screen here, and it's going to talk about several different meanings we find in the um, dictionary on engaging. Woohoo! Eh. To enter into contest or battle with the enemy when you engage in warfare. That's one meaning of engage. Let's look at the next one. To pledge oneself, to promise or guarantee, like you get engaged for marriage. On the next one, to come together and interlock as machinery or to become a part of a gear. How many of you men in here have ever worked on transmissions? I should say, and women, because we have people in here who are women who worked on them too. Whenever the wheels in a transmission fit together, if they're apart, they're not moving. A transmission is not doing its job, but you have to engage those wheels for the, to go into gear to make it work. Let's look at another definition. The next screen says to occupy, attract, or involve, like engaging someone's interest or attention thought of a lightning rod. I mean, this right here is the Washington Monument. It's one of the most struck by lightning objects in the world. Go online, check it out from years and years and years. Right here you see it hitting the side of the building where one of the little streamers are touching the top. So it's like, Whoa! So occupy, attract, or involve. How about this one? To cause someone to become involved in, like I'm engaging in a conversation with someone. Now, what we did up here, I don't know who put the me up here, but I'm really liking it. Who, who put me? Okay, never mind. I already know, because I should know that handwriting. But this is engaging. You are putting faith into operation when you walked up here and tagged those things on the cross. You engaged. Those of you who came up here for prayer, you engaged in what was going on up here. You communicated, you connected with what was going on. How many times in our life we just sit there? We listen to conversations, but we don't interact. We come in the back door, we sit down, and we leave, and we never communicate with anyone. We never connect. We never engage to get anything going at all. Unless two wheels of a transmission engage, the car's not going anywhere. And that is what we're talking about today. Let's look at what God has called us to do. He's called us to engage. He wants us to engage with him. He wants us to engage with the enemy. He wants us to engage with our calling. And he wants us to engage with others. Okay? Engaging with God. How many of you in here, you get saved and we think, wow, that's it. We get to know God. Great. We go to church on Sunday. We might go Wednesday. Okay. I've engaged with God. I'm saved. But that's not where it stops. Engaging with God is an everyday, moment by moment, as we grow in the Lord, thing that we do. 
Well, we have a question here. Why don't we engage with God? I would like for some of you out here to, what is a reason that we would not engage in a relationship with him after we get saved? Anybody have any ideas of what would keep us from actually engaging with him? Miranda? What other people think of us? Secret sins, drugs, fear, being afraid. Pride, big time. Are you guys reading a list or what? Okay. Let's, let's look at the next screen and talk about some of those. We don't realize that we can actually have a personal relationship with him. We've gotten saved. We know we're in the kingdom of God. But a lot of times we don't realize that he is our friend. He is with us no matter where we go. Sometimes we're looking for some great loud voice for him to say, Pick that up. Put that down. Do this, do that. We're expecting this loud boom from heaven to tell us exactly what we need to do because that's hearing from God. Well, can I tell you, most of the time this you're not going to... This is the Lord your God. <laughs> can I tell you that's not the way you're going to hear from him most of the time? <laughs> most of the time, Probably. Everyone, if you put your hand on your stomach, we had the youth do this in class, right above your belly button, right there. When you are struggling, when you're afraid, when you're hurt, when you're really feeling it in a bad way, that's where you feel it, isn't it? The center core of your being. Melanie brought up a point this morning in class. You, you know, you're crying, you're like, you're protecting that center core of yourself. When you get defensive, first thing you want to do is cross your arms. You're protecting who you are. When you come into a relationship with the Lord, it's like this. Father, I'm not hiding anything. I want to be open before you. No room, no closet, anything that's in me, nothing hidden from you, God. You already know it anyway. Amen. So look, we don't we, don't, we doubt sometimes if we even know his voice. When we're in sin, we don't want to engage with him until we're ready. We might even be saved and in the kingdom of God and have this little thing we're doing over here. And we know, well, that's a sin and I don't feel like I can pray because sin does separate us from God. Sin does separate. It will make you feel like you can't go to him. So that is something that will keep us from engaging in that close relationship with him. And hopefully by the end of today, we'll pray and that'll be taken care of and we can move on. Sometimes we're afraid of him. Landy said fear. Floyd said pride. These are things that keep us from engaging or connecting with God so that our car can move forward or our being. I want to look at the prophet Elijah today. Elijah was being chased by Jezebel. A lot of people in here, you know, you hear the word Jezebel. Oh, she's a Jezebel, or, you know, the Jezebel spirit. We hear that term a lot. Jezebel was chasing after Elijah. He was freaking out because all these other prophets and men of God were being killed. And Jezebel had a person go to him, to Elijah, that told Elijah that by tomorrow, if you're not dead, something's basically wrong here. And her, her, she had a vendetta against Elijah, and he was getting out of town. So in verse 8 of 1 Kings 19, it says, And he arose, he ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. Basically what happened, he ran away from Jezebel, he got in this location, an angel of the Lord fed him. Came back, he was rested, rested fed him again, and that food that he fed him that second time allowed him to go 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And he came there to a cave and stayed in the cave. Sound like a little fear going on there? He's a Christian now. He's a godly man. I mean, we all know about Elijah, you know, the prophet of God. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? The word cave, you know how some of you who are Bible scholars, you like to read, you know, Strong's Concordance, and you see how this word has a 
root meaning has a root meaning and you're trying to figure out what it really means. Well, the word cave, it's only a two-tier meaning. You have one meaning, which is um, a dwelling or an inner place. The very next thing is the primary root. Only those two meanings. The primary root of this is to be naked. To be naked. The word cave, the primary root is to be naked. He didn't want to be naked on top of the mountain where God had told him to go, exposed. He was hiding himself. He was taking care of big old capital I. Pride was there. He didn't even have the faith at that moment to believe that God could protect him from this crazy woman. Verse 10, and he said, I have been very zealous for Jehovah, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel has forsaken your covenant, and they throw down your altars, and have slain your prophets with the sword, and I, I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. Like, God, you didn't know that, so I'm telling you that, right? Let's look in verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before God, before Jehovah. And behold, Jehovah passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks. Now, mind you, he's still in the cave. Can you imagine being in a cave on a mountain, and this is happening? First of all, this crazy lunatic woman is chasing after me to kill me. And now the Lord tells me to stand on the mountain. I'm still in the cave, though. I'm scared to death. I'm not coming out, right? And behold, Jehovah passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before Jehovah. You would think that that would get him out of the cave. Because I certainly don't want rocks blocking my way. I want out. But Jehovah was not in that wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but Jehovah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was fire on a mountain, fire, but Jehovah was not in the fire. And after the fire was a still, small voice. And it happened when Elijah heard, he heard that still, small voice. And he responded because he recognized the still, small voice. And he wrapped his face in a mantle, and he went out. He finally came out of the cave, and he stood at the cave entrance. Finally, he's coming out and bearing all before God. Finally, he's not hiding anymore. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Like, what are you doing in this cave? And he said, I have been very zealous for Jehovah. Like he's got to repeat himself. The God of hosts, because the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, have thrown down your altars, and have slain your prophets with the sword. And I, I alone am left. And they seek to take my life away. He's saying it again, Lord. Don't you understand? That's why I'm hiding. Guess what Jehovah said? Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Hazael to be the king over Syria, and you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. And Elisha, which we know Elisha was his um, pre is it predecessor, What's the word? Successor. The son of Shaphat of Abel Mehola, and you shall anoint him to be king or prophet, I'm sorry, in your place. And it will be whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And then God decides to tell Elisha, he's not the only one. Yet I have left 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. And he left there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and he was plowing. Twelve pairs of oxen were before him, and he was with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. 
what I would like for us to understand about this story. We're talking about engaging with God. When God says, go on the mountain or come up higher, build your relationship with me, stand bare before me, show all, no matter what you're hiding, no matter what's going on in your life, that's exactly what he means. And if we don't take and engage with God in that and do what he said to do, not only are we missing out, because they would have found him eventually in that cave had he not been obedient. But guess what else he would have missed out on? Elisha. Not only would he have missed out on someone who was a helper to him, someone he could train, but who else after Elisha? Gehazi, the servant who ran out to tell Nahum, the king's head guard, to dip in the river Jordan and you will be healed of leprosy. It just goes on and on and on. Our lives affect other people, whether we know it or not. And when God speaks and we engage with him and we come in agreement with him and what he says and we do what it is that he's asked us to do, nothing can stop you. When you're in a grocery store, when you're at a music recital, we were at, a, um, at Miranda had a, a, a choir recital the other night. We're standing there talking. People are leaving and coming and going. Melanie's standing there talking to this young lady and she's, I can't even remember her name, Tamara. Sweet lady, she's like, oh, and I've got fibromyalgia, and, you know, I'm really struggling, and we're moving, and this and that and the other. And, Hello? That's a perfect opportunity to pray for somebody. Well, honey, let's pray right now. And Melanie and I start praying for her, and two or three other people came around and started praying for her. We engage. We locked in to what God, when things like that are revealed to you, it's for a reason. And I don't care where you are. God can heal that person. There's a story in this book. It's called, I think it's called Supernatural Life of a Christian, something along that lines. And it talks about how this man was in this, this uh, restaurant, and he's eating, no problem. He looks over, and he sees this person who's in a wheelchair. And God starts stirring them up. They get up from their table, walk over, because they're engaging with what God was showing them in their spirit. And you got, how many of you in here have ever felt that stirring in the inside of you? I know I should go pray for them. And how many of us have not prayed? And then we beat ourselves up later and say, wow, what if that was the moment God was going to heal them? Oh, okay. Can I tell you, you're going to make mistakes? We're going to make mistakes, but ask God to forgive you and just do it the next time. Okay. Okay. So this guy gets up, and he goes over to the table, and he says, you know, hi, my name is so-and-so. Do you mind if I pray for you? And they're like, oh, we've been praying to Allah for all this time to, to heal, and, and he hasn't healed. And he said, well, let me tell you, it, it, do you mind if I pray for you? Oh, sure, okay. So he prays for her. The woman's out of the wheelchair in the middle of the restaurant. They're bawling their eyes out. God healed that person right there, right then. A waitress saw what happened and said, can you come here? Walks out to the back of the restaurant. The girl gets saved and set free, delivered, all because he engaged with what God was showing him on the inside. God is calling us to engage. Yeah, engage with him. Yeah. Don't be laughing at me, Bailey. All right. These are things that we need to look at in the next screen. In order to connect and engage with him, we need to communicate with him in prayer. We need to connect with him. How do you connect with him? T-I-M-E. Time with God. Spend time with him. Well, he's not saying a whole lot. Is it because you're doing all the talking? Come on, guys. We go in. We think that prayer is one-sided a lot of times. How, when is the last time you just sat down and said, Lord, uh, here I am. I'm ready to listen. And just waited to hear from God. Now, I really mean that. When is the last time we've, we've done that? Because he wants to be able to speak too. Let's not be afraid of him. Yes, there's a godly fear we are to have for our heavenly father. But can I tell you, he's nothing like your earthly father. He's not going to bop you over the head every time you do something wrong. He's a God of grace. He's a God of love. 
How about the next one? No more excuses. If you're in sin and you know it, don't and you don't want to respond or engage until you're ready. Well, let's get ready, folks. Get it taken care of. Let's move on. Let's get this thing done. We want to be earth changers, earth movers, shakers, but yet we won't engage with God first. We need to really focus on that. Be more concerned with God's plan than your own plan to save yourself. We need to be really aware of what God's purpose is. How many times have we gone into restaurants and we just eat? Eh, you know, we don't care about what anybody else is saying. You know, we've been out to eat before where people walk up and say, I really enjoyed your conversation. Wow. They've been eavesdropping the whole time and they were blessed to hear the conversation about the awesomeness of God and it got their wheels turning. I know. Let's look at this next one. Now, we, we're talking about engaging. God wants us to engage with him. What about this next one? Bright yellow. I love bright yellow. Engaging with the enemy. The enemy. Why don't we engage with the enemy? Come on, guys. Let me know. Why don't we engage with the enemy in, in warfare, spiritual warfare? Fear. Don't want to get hurt. Don't want to let your guard down. Ignorance. Ignorance. Laziness. Woo, that's a big one. Yes, sir. Other people's reactions. When you start getting into that warfare, what's going to happen if I really stand up for myself and I do the right thing? Oh, it's someone else's responsibility, so I don't need to pray. I don't need to engage in warfare. Jenna? Responsibility, running away from responsibility. Hey, I, I, come on, guys. The youth are really starting to. It's not my job. All right, let's 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 look at some of these reasons here on the next slide. Not sure how. How many of you in here had to learn how to engage in spiritual warfare? How many of you are still learning to engage in spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is more than saying, Lord, I bind the enemy over my child. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes you have to get down on your face and cry out to God, and for the sake of the ears of the technicians, I will not do that right now, but cry out to God, my child, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind every stronghold over my child. Name the stronghold. Pull that stuff down. Have you ever prayed so hard for something that you finally felt the peace and the release? Oh, thank you, God, that it's gone. It's done. That is spiritual warfare. You dig in and you pray. If you don't even have the words to pray, that's why God gave us the gift of speaking in tongues. How many of people in the body of Christ have ran away from that gift? It is a gift that is given to us to pray to the Lord. It is a, there's different types of tongues, and I'm not going to go into the big teaching on that. If you want information on it, i got booklets back there on the foundational stones that will help you understand what tongues is. But there's your prayer language that builds your faith. It's your normal prayer language. You use it every day. Then there's other tongues that are specifically for warfare, how many of you in here have ever heard someone come up here and pray for someone and it's almost like, co -co 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 -co, you know, it's like more of a machine gun type tongue. You've heard that. That's that tongue for warfare. They're praying in the Holy Spirit for that person in a strong way that God, God himself does that. They're not doing that. That's God through them speaking and warring. And what, once you feel the release, you know it's done. You don't feel the release, you keep praying. In that di It's called a diverse tongue, a different tongue. That's why it says different kinds of tongues, because there are more than one. And we'll go into that teaching at a different time, but I'll give you that tidbit for now. We don't know who to fight. Well, if Satan has been crucified, you know, he's, he's gone because of Jesus being crucified on the cross and his power is null and void then why do I have to fight so hard to keep my healing? 
why do I have to fight so hard to, to help my children to overcome situations? Why? And, and we have this pat answer. We're in a fallen world, and that's just the way it is. Well, how about this? This building belongs to the Shield of Faith Church. We are a body. This is where we meet. This is not the church. It's the building we meet. We are the church. Amen? We are here in this building, and it belongs to us, just like healing belongs to us. Deliverance belongs to us. What if an army came in here, surrounded this entire building, and said, we're taking your building. We're going to blow it up in three seconds flat. Out of here. Are you going to sit there and say, okay, no, you got to stand up. But guess what? The president already said that these people, you know, he has power over these people and they can't do this. He already said they can't do it because it's illegal. But here they are, running their mouths, saying, we're going to take your building down. Guess what? You have to stand up and engage with the truth of the word of God. We have to. He said, I'm healed. I believe it. He said, I'm delivered. I believe it. We are fighting against Satan and the principalities in the darkness in high places. And we're getting ready to read that scripture. But we're so busy fighting ourselves and each other. Did you know that so-and-so said that? Ah! We get all freaked out about it. Or we believe what people tell us about other people. Hey, did you know? And we trust the person telling us so we believe it's true. I don't remember if it was Landy. It was someone recently posted, if you don't see it with your own eyes, then don't talk about it. That'll solve a lot of problems. We, want, we wait to be beat up instead of engaging with the enemy. Sometimes we allow him to keep rolling over on top of us. It gets worse and gets worse until finally we just had enough and then we start fighting. We're not sure what we even have to fight with. We have prayer to fight with. We have other weapons as well. Let's read that in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the world's rulers. Now they're talking about spiritual rulers of the darkness of this age. We are living in an age against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take to yourselves the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. How many of you know that we are living in a very evil day right now? It's not pretty out there. And having done all to stand, I get stories constantly coming in from the youth of different friends that they have and situations that they're in. We are living in an evil day. Therefore, because of all that I read, stand. It didn't say crawl and whine and gripe and complain. It says stand. Having your loins girded about with truth. Truth. And having the breastplate of righteousness. Right standing with God is what righteousness means. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere I go, there should be peace. My home should be a home of peace. People don't need to walk in my house and be afraid to lift something up off my my coffee table and say, oh, this is beautiful. If my house is so fragile that someone can't touch something that I have and I'm so careful about it, then I care more about my things than I do the people that are there in my home. We need to be peaceful. Everywhere we go, spreading peace, sharing peace. Oh, your hair looks great today. I love the clothes you have on. Oh, you smell wonderful. What perfume is that that you have? You know, encouraging people. Sometimes you're the only person that said anything nice to them all day long. Thanks. Thank you, Miranda. My share flare pants. Um, let's look in verse 16. Above all, take the shield of faith 
with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The fiery darts of the wicked. Where is the biggest battlefield? Point at it. Where does fear start? Where does faith start? Gotcha. Right here. I believe because I choose to believe. Oh, does that make me a flake? Oh, I believe it. Well, why do you believe? I don't know. I just believe it. Does that make me a flake because I believe the Word of God? I've read and studied the Word of God for 30 years since I was 13, and I can honestly say to you, I believe the Word of God because I've engaged with it. I have put it into practice, and honey, it works. Or I wouldn't be up here preaching it to you. I can assure you of that. And it will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. What is the opposite of fear? Faith. If you're afraid of something, you're not applying faith in that situation. When you feel afraid that, oh, I don't know if I should do this, or, oh, I'm really scared, and it's because faith needs to rise up. So lay hands on yourself. Faith? God, you said you gave me a measure of faith. Faith? Rise up in the inside of me. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. It's a song. Let it build you up. Amen? Verse 17, take on the helmet of salvation with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Can you see it? Wow. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching this very thing with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Next screen. It is time to engage the enemy. It's time for us to engage with God. This next screen, here's how we're going to do it. Start praying in tongues. If you don't have the gift of tongues yet, Lord, bless me with the Spirit that will manifest itself in a way that I will speak with the gift of tongues and move on. Don't labor there. Oh, God hasn't given me the gift of tongues yet. Ooh. You will struggle with it and be so afraid that when you won't ever get it that way because you're afraid. You're struggling. You're stressing. Just relax. It's okay. Move on. Move on. Pray for others. Know that the fight is not against flesh and blood, and know your weapons. We just went through that list. And use those weapons that God has given you. Let's look at this next one that we're to engage with. Our calling. Why don't we engage with our calling? Anyone have any input on that? Too afraid. Wow, this list sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Jenna. Jenna. The responsibility word is a good one that you used earlier. We're afraid of responsibility. We don't want all that pressure. Overwhelmed. Like, how can I, how, how can I do that, Lord? A lot of times we don't even know what our calling is. We don't even pray to find out what it is. Good one. Yes, sir. A calling of God is when you know that you know that you know that God has put his hand on your life for specific purpose. This young lady right here has got a gift of anointing for healing and prayer for inner healing as well. She knows it. We know it. We acknowledge that. You want healing? Engage with her. Come up here. You ask her. You say, please pray for me. She will come up here and pray for you in a heartbeat. Your calling is what you believe that God has asked you to do with your life. Every single person in here has been born for a reason. Well, my parents didn't want me. I just happened to be born. It was, I was a mistake. How many times the enemy tried to lie to you and say that? Can I tell you that God was even in control of that? The Bible says, I formed you in your mother's womb. I knit you together. He had a choice at that. He could have said, no, I'm not going to create that person yet. And he did in a miraculous way. You are special. He didn't just take 40 weeks of making every intricate part of you just to say, he's a mistake or she's a mistake. It's for a reason. 
I have known since I could breathe practically that I was born to be a leader, to teach. It has been in my blood forever and ever. And the enemy has bombarded me, bombarded me. But you know what? I engaged with God, with the enemy, and told him that he wasn't going to stop it. And I engaged with my calling. And I put myself out there and said, okay, Lord. I crawled out of the cave and said, here I am. Take whatever you want of me. You have my house. You have my car. It's not mine. Nothing I have here on this earth is mine. It does not belong to me. It's his. And when we get into perspective that it's his job to make sure my finances are met. Yes, we have a part. We have to look for a job. We don't just sit there and watch TV all day and expect it all to happen. We do have our part. But engage with your calling. Stop and take about five seconds, ten seconds. What are you called to do? Homework? No. (laughs) For right now, that's probably your calling. (laughs) School and homework, yes. I love these kids. They'd really keep me on my toes. What is your calling? Are you to be singing up here on praise team? Well, engage. Come up here and talk to the sister up here after you end up the service, okay? Talk to me. I've got young children that are coming to me now saying, I have a desire to worship. That's all I want to do is sing. I want to worship. They don't, (laughs) Jenna, you know, they're not about coming up here and just, oh, look at me, I'm singing. They really have a desire in their heart, even at young ages, to worship God. Are you called to teach? Be here for Sunday service in the men's Sunday school, in the women's Sunday school. They give opportunity all the time for people to teach, to get you familiar with how to teach. They give you guidelines. They even show you what to do. Engage with your calling. If I have a migraine, I know who to call. Bill Billingsley. He has faith for migraine healing. You get a migraine, you go up through your little directory and you call Bill and he will pray for you and your headache will go. He has faith for my, we need to know each other and that'll take us to the next thing, engaging with others in just a minute here, but we need to know each other's callings and anointings and work together as a team. Pastor Bob has been talking to us on Wednesday nights about the ministry and how it's set up and all the intricate parts and how we work together for the greater good, for the glory of God. Well, this is what I believe is on the heart of God. Let's engage and lock in with these things and not just wait for it to happen. All right, let's look at the next screen. These are some excuses we come up with for not engaging with our calling. I'm not smart enough. Why would he want me to do it? Someone else is more qualified than I am. I'm busy, someone else is already doing it. Can I tell you? Leading worship, I enjoy with every fiber of my being. But can I tell you that's not my number one calling? Maybe somebody out there is called to lead worship. Don't just think because I'm up here leading worship that you can't ever lead worship because Michelle's leading worship. Michelle's over the youth group. Don't, be, don't think like that. We are so open here. You want to come in and you start you know, helping out with the youth and being a part. Engage on... Start somewhere. Talk to us. There's a lot of work that needs to be done around here that we can work. Hey, your calling may be to keep the ditch clean. Lord, help us. We need someone to help keep the ditch clean. You know what? If the person that's called to clean the ditch and keep that grass down doesn't do their job, we have snakes up here with our kids. We have Melanie and Flip Flops squishing copperheads in the middle of the... Yes, she did. You know, we, these parts are important. We need us to engage. All right, how about this? I'm busy. Someone else is already doing it. I'm afraid. I have a lack of faith in myself to believe that God can do it through me. I'll read that one again. A lack of faith in myself to believe that God can do it through me. This next screen Some people want a priest or a preacher to do it for them. I got people calling me who've been in the body of Christ for years. Oh, 
do you have any scripture that I can pray or say to bind this enemy that's harassing me? You know, these are things that we need to learn. I'm not scolding anyone. If you aren't sure, if you're not familiar with this, let's learn. Let's read our Bibles. Let's really get interested in what God has for us. Moses wanted Aaron to do it for him. We know that story. Let's, let's look at uh, Sarah, even. There's so many stories. I can just keep going on and on. In Genesis 18, and I'm not going to probably read all of these, but let's... Um, Let's skip down to the next screen in verse 12. You know, here's Sarah and Abraham. They're old. They haven't had a son. They haven't had children. And here, these, these three angels show up at their home, basically, and are telling Abraham, guess what? The time of life, which is within nine months, your wife will bear you a son. And she hears it. And she laughs. Wah! She's like 90-some years old. You want to be 90 birthing a baby? Some of y'all are like 40 and don't want any more kids. 90? Okay. And then in verse 14, is anything too hard for Jehovah? At the time, the appointed, I will return again according to the time of life, which is the birthing time of 40 weeks, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied saying it. I didn't laugh because she was afraid. He said, oh, no, but you did laugh. She was having a hard time engaging with that calling of raising a son at 90-some years old, but she was kind of, well, yeah, I think I'd have been freaking out too. Let's look at Exodus 4, 1. And Moses, let's talk about Moses. He answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. This is when God called him to go and speak and, and you know, go to Pharaoh and say, hey, set my people free. My people have been in bondage in Egypt all these years. And here's Moses. Now, remember, Moses has been raised in the courts of Pharaoh. He knows how to speak Egyptian. He knows how to speak Hebrew because his own birth mother raised him up in the home. He does have good language skills. We always say, oh, he wasn't eloquent at speech. He was stutterer. He was this. He was that. Let's look at what the Bible says about it, though. They will not believe me or listen to my voice. So he's giving excuses. Why don't we engage with our calling? Excuses, excuses, we hear them every day. But the devil, he'll supply them if the church folks stay away. Remember that song? Yeah, it's an old song. Sorry, I reached way deep for that one. All right, let's look in the next screen. Exodus 4.10, way back. And Moses said to Jehovah, Oh, my Lord, I am not a man of words now, nor since you've spoken to me, your servant, even back back and back, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Let's look at the translation of the contemporary English version. And I've looked at very many versions. I've got like buku versions on my computer. And this one right here, when you look at the root words and you really hone in on it, this is the best translation for this particular verse that I found. Moses replied, I have never been a good speaker. I wasn't one before you spoke to me, and I'm not one now. I am slow at speaking, and I can never think of what to say. That's true. That is what he was telling God. Well, how am I going to know what to say? What was he doing? He was thinking that it was in himself to know what to say to Pharaoh to let the people go. He still had not engaged with his calling. He still had not realized that the God of all universe, who even created his mouth, was going to give him the words to say. Oh, let's look in the next screen. Exodus 4, 13 and 14. Moses begged, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Is that what we're saying today with our calling? Lord, please let Michelle stay up there and sing and worship. Please don't make me have to come up here and play the keyboard. I might mess up. Lord, please don't call me to work with the youth. 
Lord, please, are we begging God to not send us? How many people is that going to affect later on down the road? And the anger of the Lord Jehovah or of Jehovah was kindled against Moses. God was upset with him, but he also, God was going to answer those prayers whether Moses went or not. He was going to come up, you know, hey, he allowed Aaron to be the one to go forth to speak. And at some point, I think Moses said, you know what, I had better just do this. And Aaron was kind of not speaking anymore. Moses stepped in finally to his calling. Mm -hmm. Remember John the Baptist's father, Zechariah. He was going into the, uh, well, let's just read it, Luke 1, 11. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him as he was standing on the right of the altar of incense. It was the altar of incense. And seeing this, Zechariah was troubled and fear fell on him. Fear, he was afraid. Now, does he have faith right there? No, he was very fearful. And behold, you shall be silent and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because you did not believe my words, which shall be fulfilled in their time. He goes in, this is Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, and he's ministering in the temple. He's at the altar of incense, and this angel shows up and says, hey, your wife's going to have a baby. Another one of those, oh, no way. And he's, he's not believing it's going to happen. And because he didn't believe, he wasn't engaging in what communication and all the calling that God had called him to be the father of John the Baptist. We all know what happened to him. Okay? He was called to be the father of John the Baptist. And he didn't believe that God could open his wife's womb. So he didn't speak until that baby was born. And one of the first words out of his mouth was the name of that child because God had already told him what his name was to be. Let's look at Jonah. My youth are a step ahead of me here. Jonah 1, and the word of Jehovah came to Jonah, saying, okay, a midi Verse 2, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their evil has come up before me. But jo Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of Jehovah. And he went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish and he gave its fare and went down into it to hide, basically, in order to go with them to Tarshish, away from the sight of Jehovah. Really? Can we really go that far? Jehovah, you can't see me now, can you? I see you wherever you go. Okay. Don't run from your calling. It's time to engage in our calling. Are you ready? Did you think about what your calling is? If you don't know what your calling is, pray and ask God and he'll show you. On the next slide. Hey, let's just get over ourselves. It's not all about us. It's about God. Know that God has called you to do something that's, know that God hasn't called you to do something that's too hard. He created you to do the very thing he's called you to do. It's a done deal. It's not too hard because guess what? It's not you anyway. It's him and his power through you. In high school, I was the quiet girl. I didn't say a whole lot. Yeah, laugh. I was the preacher girl. I stood out there with the people smoking, and I went to the parties while they were smoking pot and doing things, not all the time. But I was the good girl. I was the one who didn't do those things. But I was there, and I helped them to get home safe, to do the right thing. And years later, some of these people are still doing the same things they were back in high school. And they're on my Facebook, and they read my posts, and I get private messages from them Thank you for the scripture you shared today. It ministered to me. And they're coming forth. They're coming forth. God is with you every step of the way. Others need us to be obedient. Don't be too busy for God. As much as I do, I cannot be too busy for God. If I don't get up first thing in the morning, read my word and pray, 
before I start my deal, where am I mentally throughout the day? And I want to encourage all of you, get your devotionals. If you've got to put them in the bathroom so you can open them and read them, encourage yourself in the Lord. Don't be afraid. The calling of God is irrevocable. It's on you no matter where you go, no matter what you do. I know someone right now who's called in youth ministry, right now, should be leading youth. They are involved in sexual lifestyle that is not appropriate, and God is still using them in that. They may die and not even go to heaven because they're engaging in this lifestyle on purpose. And the Bible says that if you continue to practice certain sins, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But yet God knows the calling on their life, and they're still ministering to youth no matter where they go. It's amazing how God still does that. Romans eleven twenty nine 29, for the free gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I have about five minutes left, and we'll let you guys go. Let's look at the next screen. Engage with others. Why don't we engage with other people? The same list. So we've heard fear, fear of responsibility, fear of what other people may say. I'm afraid of their response. I don't want any conflict with anybody. I don't want anyone to laugh at me. I don't want to lose my family for standing up for what's right. Exactly. I have my children to protect. I can't move in my calling because if I move in my calling, you know, it's going to put more pressure on my children. Can I tell you it does to a point? Because in youth group, Mine and Melanie's children are high, are, any of the leader's children are held to a higher accountability, and they're probably called down a lot more than anybody else's kids. I can tell you that. Because they need to learn that they are an example to the other youth. I'm busy. Okay. I don't want to engage with others because I'm too busy. I want to hide in my cave. Who's got a man cave in here? Yeah, we like our man caves. Girls have their girl caves, too. Don't, don't forget that. <laughs> I'm not the best person to talk to them. Let Pastor Bob. Hey, Pastor Bob, can you call so-and-so? They're really struggling. Hey, Pastor Bob, can you go to the hospital and visit my aunt, uncle, cousin, sister, friend? It's okay to let them know to be praying. But you know what? If you haven't gone down to that hospital to visit your aunt, sister, cousin, sister, friend, whoever it is, you know, do you think that that's fair. I mean, I, and they go graciously. I'm not saying don't call them. No, don't get me wrong, but are you engaging with the opportunity that God's given you to see someone healed and set free? Amen? All right. This is so beautiful. Mark 16. And he, who's he? He said to them, who was he? Jesus. Jesus said to them, go into all the world. Remember the story about Elisha? Elijah? And God told him, go. It was only, oh, let's just go. Go into all the world. Proclaim the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And miraculous signs will follow to those believing these things. In my name that will cast out demons. Raise your hand high if you've ever cast out a demon out of yourself, somebody else, okay? In my name they will speak with new tongues. Raise your hand if you've ever spoken in tongues. In my name they will tape up serpents. We got any serpent carriers around here? Have you ever been held? All right, I was going to say, we got a couple people in here. All right. No, we, would, we do not have cages in the back with snakes. We will not be bringing them out at the end of the service for anyone who's watching this video. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. Now, some of you don't know that you've drank deadly things because you weren't told. And some of you drink deadly things because you want to. And it hasn't hurt you. And I don't want to say yet because I'm afraid to say yet because I want to be careful here. But we need to be very careful what we're putting in our body. Some things are not, ex or some things are, are legal. 
expedient. Some things are legal. Well, okay, yeah, but not all things are expedient. That's right. Yeah, that. They will take up servants. Da, 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 da. They will lay hands on the sick and they will be he healed. They will be well. Raise your hand if you've laid hands on somebody and they've recovered. Okay, we got a powerful group up in here. Then indeed, after speaking to them, the Lord was taken up into heaven and he sat on the right hand of God. He's there now, forever making intercession and prayers for you, 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 you. He's waiting for us to engage. And then what did he tell them to do? He told them to go. Well, what did they do? Well, he's gone. What are we going to do? Jesus isn't here to help us. No, let's look. Verse 20, and going out, they proclaimed everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming, let's read that together, confirming the word by miraculous signs following. Amen. Next slide. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. When we get that in our spirit, when we really know that, you're just in a tent looking out. Your spirit man's just looking out of this tent. But he's preparing for us a mansion. It's not a mansion like a building, folks. It's what we're going to be living in. It's what we're going to be living in. It's nothing compared to this. We are spiritual beings. And if we engage ourselves with God, engage ourselves when we need to with the enemy, with our calling and with other people, we're going to be a powerful group of people in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Next screen. It's time to engage with others. Two more slides we'll read and then we'll be done here. Some people will never know Jesus until you engage in conversation with them. I'll say that again. Some people will never know Jesus until you engage in conversation with them. Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who can kill this body but are not able to save the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 14, verse 26, if people come to me and are not ready to abandon their fathers, mothers, wives, children, brothers, sisters, as well as their own lives, they cannot be my disciples. Selfishness is one of the biggest, biggest problems, I believe, in the body of Christ today. Be willing to die if that's what it takes to serve your Lord. No guts, no glory. That's what just came to me. No guts, no glory. Come on, folks. We're in warfare. If you only serve when it's convenient for you, you're not a real servant. Real servants do what is needed even when it's inconvenient. Are you available to God anytime? Can he mess up your plans without you becoming resentful? Ouch. As a servant, you don't get to pick and choose when or where you'll serve. Being a servant means giving up the right to control your schedule and allowing God to interpret it whenever he needs to. And I'll close with this. When the Israelites were in Egypt and they were being tortured by having to work nonstop, and God sent Moses to take them into the promised land, one thing that they did when they were in the, in the wilderness while they were wandering before they went in is they had to follow God. The tabernacle, whenever the cloud moved, they packed it up in a certain way and they followed the cloud. Cloud by day, fire by night. When it stopped, they'd unpack it all out. And I don't care if it was a day later, an hour later, if that cloud or that fire moved again, they packed it all back up and they followed. It was not their schedule. It was God's schedule. Let's be led by the Holy Spirit this week. When people come to us and talk to us about their ailments or their situations, Miss Susan is a perfect example of that. 
If we ever go to Miss Susan and say, oh, you know, the situation I have, oh, I don't know what to do, oh, Miss Susan, oh, what is the first thing she does? Pray. She prays. She says, let's just pray. And sometimes we just need to do that. Let's just pray. And if it's someone that's not saved and you're not real sure if they'll let you, just ask them, do you mind if I pray for you? And pray for them. I am looking forward to hearing stories of what happens because we've been engaging ourselves with God, the enemy, our calling, and with other people. Amen. Praise God. Go ahead. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Every